I want to introduce you uh, Ludovic Cortez. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> it's wrong. And uh, he have a talk to, uh, about the geeks uh, in the container age system managing. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for the introduction. All right, good evening, everyone. So, indeed, I'm going to talk about GNU Geeks. And I'm in a containers track, containers and, and security, I think it's called. So I'm a bit of an outlier because I'm going to talk about Geeks, which is in part about containers, but you know, it's mostly about deployment in general, and it's a bit also about distros. So yeah, I'm an outlier. So before I start talking about Geeks itself, uh, let me just do a, a brief introduction to talk about distros and the state of distributions. So if you were already in this room early in the afternoon, like at 2 p.m., I think, uh, there was a talk, and the abstract of the talk had these lines, which is, you know, the Linux distribution, as we know, it is coming to an end, and it's being replaced, roughly, by containers. So I suppose that many people in the audience are pretty much into containers and using Docker and these kind of tools, so perhaps you can feel that there is some truth in that statement, and I, I do feel that there is some truth in that statement, right? We're all using containers more and more. Uh, yet, I would like to challenge that idea that you know, this is the, the future, this is the only way we can move forward. Actually, last year at FOSDEM, I was giving a talk in the distributions dev room. And so I wanted to you know, look at the history of distributions with respect to other tools. And yeah, like I said last year, we were in a, you know, so the distributions dev room was much smaller than this one, and that was mostly distribution developers, and I had the impression that it was actually the desperate distribution developers dev room in a way, because, you know, distributions are not so much in fashion these days. That's my impression. Perhaps you would agree. But back when I started with free software, we had these distributions, for example, Slackware, Debian, and the Red Hat distribution, and they were pretty much at the center of the stage for free software. Like, they were the gateway to free software. You had, I mean, that was really high technology in a way. It allowed you to deploy software in a way that was pretty much new, like uh, proprietary software didn't have anything equivalent, and you could quickly run app get install blah, and you get your application, plus all its dependencies. You don't have to compile it. It's just you know, high tech, right? So there was, I think there was a lot of activity around distributions, and they were at the center of the stage, right? That was the golden age of distributions. But then it started becoming cloudy. People started to realize there are some shortcomings in distributions as we know them. So, for example, I happen to work with people uh, who do high performance computing, HPC. So, they are using clusters with lots of users, and obviously, you're not going to run sudo app get install on, on the cluster, right? Uh, I mean, some people do, but not every user, it's only sysadmins. So, you need to find a way to allow scientists to deploy their software stack. And for that, well, you can just let them compile everything by hand. Or you can use one of the tools that have been developed over time. So for example, one of the most common one is called modules. I don't know if you've heard about that one. It's extremely common on HPC clusters. Uh, it basically allows you to define your programming environment. So you can say module load up an MPI, module load GCC, blah, blah, blah. And every user can define their environment independently of other users, so you get a lot of flexibility. But of course, the downside is that HPC sysadmins end up creating a distribution on their own just for their own cluster. And so there's a lot of duplicated work. It's not, you know, it's not exactly efficient, I would say. But uh, yeah, modules is pretty much like virtual env. So you've probably heard about virtual env for Python. Modules is somehow more generic, but it doesn't take care of actually building the software, so you still need to do it by hand. And then there are tools like SPAC or EasyBuild that actually take care of automating builds, like running configure, make, make, install for each of your packages, roughly. These are package managers 
layered on top of the distribution that's running in the system. So in a way, we're already layering additional package managers on top of the distribution just because the distribution has limitations, right? That doesn't feel so great. And then you have deployment tools like Ansible, Puppet, Propler, Chef, all these tools. So these are not package managers, right? So it's kind of a different category. But still, I think you know, deploying software in general is kind of the distribution's job, right? Typically, when you deploy systems using Ansible, you fiddle with the configuration of the system, you install packages, and things like that. It's, it's sort of the distribution's job, just apply to a bunch of machines instead of just a single machine, roughly. So it tells something that we have to yet add another layer of tools on top of the distribution just to uh, you know, address that use case. Uh, well, it can still get worse. I'm sure you're familiar with all the you know, language-specific package managers. They are wonderful tools for you know, people who develop programming languages. You know, it's, it's a very easy way to allow your users to get started and use libraries in your language. That's great from that point of view, but you know, it adds another layer of software deployment on top of all these tools, and it becomes a little bit messy when I mean, in practice, many people end up using, you know, like five of these tools maybe on a daily basis because they want to deploy Python code, maybe, you know, Rust code, maybe Haskell code, and so you have lots of different tools depending on the kind of code that you're deploying. It doesn't feel great. And lastly, well, that's the thunder. Uh, containers, right? So it's become so complex to manage all these software stack that you need to have a way to, to say, all right, I'm just giving up. I managed to get something that works, right? I managed to get to a state that's actually usable. I have all my software installed for my application. This is perfect. I don't want to touch it anymore. So I'm just going to freeze it in an image, a Docker image, for example, and then I can carry the bits of my system to another machine, for example, and I can run my application again without having to fiddle with pip, cargo, add get, blah, blah, blah. Um, it does solve problems, practical problems for people, but still it doesn't feel right to me, right? We, we're sort of giving up on deployment, right? It's too complex, let's just freeze, we get an image, and then we, we use it and we don't bother anymore. So then feel right. So, my question last year in that distributions dev room was, are these tools doomed? Well, maybe, maybe not. The good news for distributions is, you know, well, we had people saying Debian and other distributions are going to be that thing you run Docker on and little more, you know, it's the end. But the good news is it's also that thing you run inside Docker because that's how you deploy software, right? So that's, that's the own cloud Docker file, for example, how they deploy their dependencies. Well, first they start by running AppGate, and that's it. So that tells something, and to me, it means that perhaps we should pay attention. Uh, yeah, going back to that Docker file. This is great, it does the job, but it lacks transparency. So if we look at the first line, the first line of the Dockerfile says, okay, I'm gonna start with that big blob that contains uh, you know, a whole distribution, and from there, I'm gonna run a bunch of commands to modify the state of my container image to install additional software, and so on and so forth. And so the end result of that is that containers are like smoothies. So that's a phrase I borrowed from Ricardo Vermes, another Geeks hacker. Uh, it, a container is like a smoothie in the sense that you can taste it, right? You can say whether you like it or not, whether it's to your taste. But it's really hard to say what's inside that smoothie, right? It's like, yeah, it's red, but what's in there? I don't really know. Um, it lacks transparency. <laughs> 
And usually when we say that, people will come to us and say, well, look, come on, you're exaggerating. We have a Docker file, so it's entirely transparent. We know what's inside. Well, do we? I mean, if we go back to that Docker file, can someone really tell me what software packages are in there? I'm not sure. You know, we're just, if we run that Docker file, we're going to get different results every time we run it, because the first command that we run in there is apt-get update, right? So if I run it today, I'm going to get, you know, specific versions of the packages, but if I run it in two months, I'm going to get different versions. So that's not great. Plus, if we look at that form line up there, it doesn't tell us what's in there. So the, the abstraction level is the wrong one. We'd like to think in terms of packages that are available, and what we have instead is uh, something pretty opaque. So I believe we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Oh, uh, I took this picture from Wikipedia and I learned that it's actually a German saying from the 16th century. Yeah, keep learning things while you're procrastinating. Anyway, so probably there are still valuable things we can learn from distributions and maybe we should try to design systems not by piling tools and patches upon patches, but instead by addressing the weaknesses that make those patches appear necessary. I'm paraphrasing a, a sentence that some of you have probably heard before. It's not from me. Uh, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so that brings me to gigs. Uh, how many people here have heard, are familiar with the gigs, I should say? Well, that's like half of the audience, I would say. All right, so you're, if you're familiar with gigs, I guess you're allowed to take a five-minute nap because I'm going to introduce it. That's fine. And don't forget to wake up afterwards. Uh, <laughs> we'll get there. So, gigs. What is gigs about? So we tend to view it as a distribution or as a package manager, but it's really more than that. It's, it's more like, you could say, it's a toolbox for software deployment in general, and that includes package management in the traditional meaning of the word, but also environment management, container provisioning, and operating system management, so complete operating systems. So I give, um, I give you a feel of what it is to use Geeks to get started with Geeks and what it's like. I start with a quick demo just to give you a feel, right? All right, so I guess the first, the, the way you would get started with Geeks is by using, you know, the traditional Geeks install command. So you would say Geeks install cause Python, for example, and it does what you would expect, right? It installs packages, all right? So from there I can say echo high pipe cause. So it seems you have to use Kalse in, in demos, so I thought I would do the same as everyone else. That's why I have Kalse. And all right, now I have Kalse. If if we look up there at this message, uh, it's telling me something about environment variables, right? And typically, when you install software, very often you have to you know set environment variables so that it works just fine. And that's typically the kind of thing I tend to forget. So here. Geeks takes care of telling you, well, there is a file that will set those environment variables for you, so you can just source that file, which is what I'm going to do here. And that file, if we, if we look at that file um, that lives here, well, it's telling me in particular about Python path because I installed Python. So if I want to be able to use Python, then I better set Python path correctly so that it can find its libraries, right? So I've installed uh, Calce, Python. Let's say I can install uh, Guile, the programming language. All right, so at this point I have Python 3. I have Guile, I have Calce. It's all working fine. But let's, let's say after a while, I realize that Guile is such a great programming language, I no longer need Python. That can happen. So I can simply remove Python, the usual thing. It, it looks boring at this point, but you'll see. <laughs> We're getting to the interesting bit. All right, 
So I've done a bunch of operations on my system. I've installed software, you know, several times we moved software. And this is where we get to the interesting bit, which is that this was all transactional, actually. And the, the history of my profile, which means the set of packages that I installed, was entirely recorded. So I can just say, can you list the uh, generations of my profile? So basically, every time I made a transaction, I created a new generation. That's the way we call it. And here we see those three generations. So generation one is when I type kickst install calce python, right? So we see these two packages up there. Generation two is when I type kicks install guile. So that added guile to my set of install packages which is why we see a plus there. It's like a diff. And generation three is when I removed Python from my profile. And this is why we see a minus there. It's, again, like a diff. The cool thing here is that you can actually roll back, right? So if I have second thoughts and, well, I still need Python after all, then I can say, let's roll back, okay? I'm going back to generation two, and at that point, if I run gigs list generations again, then I see that I'm back to generation two. That makes sense? Yeah. So to me, this is, this is in itself a good enough reason to use gigs because as a user, it gives peace of mind. Like, you know, you cannot break your system because if you run an upgrade just before your talk and something breaks, that's fine. You can just fall back, right? So that's cool. All right, so, so far from so much for uh, package management. The other cool thing is that, so here I've been using a sequence of gigs install, gigs remove commands, but, but I can just as well use directly a file where I declare the packages that I want to have in my profile, my set of install packages. So let's say I want GCC, Emacs, Guile, and Gazer then I can just create a file that contains that and pass it to gigs package dash dash manifest. And yeah, so I have an example here. My profile, yeah. So I pass that file to gigs package. And then what happens is that those three packages, maybe we're not gonna wait because Wi-Fi is not so fast, but those three packages are going to be downloaded if they're not available yet. And then eventually I will end up with a profile that contains precisely those three packages. This is it, right? So no need to type a sequence of install, remove, upgrade commands. That's pretty cool because it means that you can have that file under version control, for example. You can share it with other people, with colleagues or whatever. Or if you're developers, then you can, you know, have it as part of your project repository. It makes it, it, makes it very easy to deploy a set of packages. Right. But if, if you look at that manifest here, I'm, I'm just saying GCC toolchain, for example. I'm not specifying any version. So if I really want to enable someone else to reproduce the same environment as I have here, then I need an extra bit of information. Because, for example, GCC today is perhaps version 9, but in three months, it might be version 10. And so if I run, if I use that file in, in three months, then I'm not going to get the same environment as right now. I'm going to get a newer version of GCC. So how do we address that? Well, that extra bit of information that we need to know exactly what how to reproduce the same environment is given by a command that's called gigs describe. And so you've probably seen git describe before, and gigs describe is very similar. It just tells you which revision of gigs you're currently using. So I have a commit ID here, and with that information, I have Bob, Bob on his laptop running gigs describe that gives us a commit ID. And then I can have Alice on a completely different machine, maybe at a different point in time. And Alice can just say gigs pool that commit, and then gigs package dash dash manifest, and then Alice will get exactly the same environment as Bob. Same versions, same packages, everything is the same. 
that's a big deal in, in some cases. I mean, anytime you want to have precise reproducibility, and in particular in reproducible science, for example, people are very keen on, on that kind of feature. And so the, the summary that you can travel in space and time with gigs. It is pretty cool. It's actually it's so cool that someone ended up adding a time machine command. <laughs> so we're very much into that spirit. So time machine does pretty much like pull followed by uh, install in that case. So if I say time machine dot commit install hello, then I'm installing the hello package from gigs at that commit, right? Make sense? Okay. So another way to use gigs is to set up development environments or one-off environments in general. So for example, if I want to use Python, well, I can type gigs install Python, blah, but I can also use that gigs environment command. And what it's going to do in this case is to set up a one-off environment that contains precisely those packages that I asked for, Python, NumPy, SciPy. So this is what it looks like. So the dash dash ad hoc option says I want precisely those packages. NumPy, and I'm going to run the Python 3 command directly in that environment. And so from there, if I do import NumPy, it works, right? So I have a shell where Python is available, NumPy is available, and Python path is set correctly so that Python can find Python can find NumPy. All right. And on top of that, you can actually say, uh, for example, let's say I want core utils. Um, I can add the dash dash container option. And what the dash dash container option is, does is the same as Gix environment, but in addition to that, it creates a container. So using the Linux unprivileged user namespace feature, a container that contains only the packages I asked for plus the current directory. So for example, if I do ls slash home in there, there's not much in that directory, and my, my home is actually empty because it's not mapped from the outside of the container. right? So it's a very good way to, you know, to get in a, a very isolated environment where you can do your development and all that. All right. So I said I would talk a bit about containers. Right? Uh, it turns out that sometimes you have to deal with machines that do not run gigs, right? So how do you go from a machine that runs gigs where you have all your favorite software packages to a machine that unfortunately does not yet run gigs, but still you want to be able to run your packages there. So how do you do that? Well, we need some sort of an interoperability bridge, and this is what Geekspack does. So Geekspack, the way it works, you give it a number, a list of packages, and it will create, by default, it will create a table that contains those packages and all their dependencies. That's it. So in this case, I'm getting a table that contains Python, NumPy, but also libc, because Python depends on libc, and perhaps a couple of other libraries. It becomes really cool when you add the dash dash relocatable option. So if you add that option, you get a table that contains, again, Python and NumPy, but in addition to that, Python, the, the Python executable is wrapped in a way that allows it to just run from anywhere. So in other words, you can unpack that tarball anywhere on your file system, like in your home directory, and from there you can type dot slash bin slash python, and it just works, right? So that relies on either on, again, on unprivileged username spaces uh, on Linux or on, a, on pwrt, which is another tool that allows you to, uh, you know, to virtualize the file system, things like that. But of course, if you insist on using Docker, because Docker is everywhere anyway, so if you want to transfer your, your, the bits of your packages to a Docker-powered machine, then you can always create a Docker image using the dash dash format equals to Docker option, and you get your Docker image. You can say Docker load, Docker run, and it just runs. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it, it, it may sound a bit ironic because I just said before that containers are bad, okay? But don't get me wrong. I mean, containers are really two things. There is the, the packaging part and the runtime part. So the packaging part is the Docker file, and this is what I'm criticizing, but the runtime part is just fine. And so here the advantage when you create a, a Docker image with Geeks Pack is that you get a reproducible image, right? So it's not like when you use a Docker file, you're pretty sure that the image is not going to be reproducible. It's going to depend on the time at which you run it, for example. It's going to depend on the availability of a number of things on the network. But here, you know, it's going to be reproducible, right? Geeks Pack Python is always going to give you the same image. That makes a difference. All right, so far so good. So I've been talking about package management, environment management, containers. Now I need to talk a bit about operating systems. This is the next level. So the way it works, oh, this is a conversation I captured on IRC a couple of days ago, and I found it a good summary of the story. So the story here, when you use Geek System, which is a standalone distribution, the story is that you just, you tell it what you want, right? You describe what you want in your operating system, and then you give it to Geeks, and it just puts everything in place. You just need to speak its language, of course, but like I said, it's such a fine language anyway. So let me show you how that works. So this is an operating system declaration. Hope you can read it, yeah? So in that single configuration file, you would actually describe all the details about your operating system, right? So that includes like the host name, the time zone, the locale, file systems, user accounts, services, everything. And so the services here, we're just, we're just asking for, not much actually, we're just asking for a DHCP client service and for OpenSSH with the, just the default configuration options. Don't be scared. You don't have to learn that right from the start. So typically when you get started with Geek System, you would download the ISO installation image, and the ISO installation image contains a menu-based installer, pretty much like that of Debian, where you can choose you know, all the parameters of your system, and it generates that file for you. So that's how you would get started with Geek System. But the thing here is once you have this file ready, you can pass it to the Geek System command and do a number of interesting things. So for example, you can say Geek System VM that config file and it will create a script that spawns a VM running the system. Or you can say Geek System Docker image and creates a Docker image for that system. Or you can say Geek System container and it creates a script to spawn a container on your machine. And lastly, but importantly, you can say Geek System reconfigure in that case, you just reconfigure your machine on the bare metal so that, well, you just instantiate that configuration, right? So you no longer have to fiddle with configuration bits everywhere on your system, right? It's entirely declarative. You say, I want these services, these user accounts. You say, then you type reconfigure, and you get what you asked for. It's as simple as this. And the good thing is that, again, you can well, you can first test your system in a VM. You can run Geek System VM on that config and see how, what it looks like, right? If it runs the way you expect. And once you're happy with the result, at that point you can run Geek System Reconfigure. And if there is still, for some reason, a problem at that point with the configuration, you can always roll back the whole system configuration. Okay? So again, it's super safe. Like, as a user, you can go ahead reconfigure, no worries. If something goes wrong, you just fall back and everything is fine. So of course, people have been wanting to take it to the next level and you know, try to deploy in a bunch of machines at once. And so this is, this is a brand new feature actually. It's, it's from a Google Summer of Code internship that was super productive, super efficient. And the thing we're doing here is that we define a function up here that says, all right, given the machine number n, 
here is the operating system configuration. So essentially, it's just producing a different host name. And then here I have a bit of code that maps over a list of numbers, one, two, three, four, five. And for each number, it returns a, a, well, a configuration for a machine that uses that operating system and says the machine is available over SSH, and that's it. And if you pass that configuration file to the new gigs deploy command, then it will actually deploy the system on all these five machines over SSH, and that's it. And this is pretty cool, I think. Um, so this is for machines that are accessible over SSH, but there's another backend currently that's um, the DigitalOcean VPS. So if you want to deploy to DigitalOcean, it should work like this. This is still very much better at this point, like we are aware of some shortcomings, but that's, I think it paves the way to a, a very convenient way to deploy over a number of machines in a reproducible way. All right. I've been talking a lot about features, what it feels like to use Geeks. I hope you now have a better idea of what it's like, what you can do with it. But I think it's also important to talk about uh, other properties of Geeks as a distribution. It turns out that Geeks is very much about source code. So it's a GNU package, so it will come as no surprise if I tell you that we're concerned about making sure that uh, users have the freedom to actually you know, see what software they're running, for example, modify it easily, deploy it easily, and all that. And it turns out that Gix is pretty much a source-based distribution. So like, like I explained before, in practice, you get binary packages most of the time. That's what we're aiming for, because you don't want to wait for LibreOffice to build on your laptop, right? But Geeks knows about you know, the source code that leads to a given binary artifact. That's the thing. So for example, if we look at the package definition for Audacity, it looks like this. You, know, you have the usual pieces of metadata. And in particular, we have the GitHub, Git repo URL, and we specify the commit that we want to build from. So far, so great. So far, so good. But I mean, if you've been following along, I told you about that, that wonderful time machine command before. This is great. But what if I, you know, I go back to the future and somehow, for some reason, that Git repository disappeared in the meantime? We have a problem, right? We can no longer reproduce the, the binary package because we actually lost the source. And this is where software heritage comes in. So have you heard about software heritage? Yeah, all right. So software heritage is, is just an archive of source code. So they are trying to basically archive all the source code that's out there forever. That's, that's the idea. And it comes in very handy for free software in general and for gigs and other distributions because it means we can just fall back to software heritage whenever we want to access source code that has disappeared from its upstream location. And this is great. So we have tooling in Geeks that allows us to verify whether a given repo is available in Software Heritage. And if it's not, we can say, all right, please archive this Git repo. And on top of that, there is work, ongoing work by um, NixOS people to provide additional information to Software Heritage so that they can, we can make sure they archive every source table that our distributions, NixOS and Geeks, refer to. So Eventually, the goal is that for every package available in Geeks and NixOS, well, Software Heritage will have the source code archive, so we'll be safe. That's one thing about source code. The other thing about source code is reproducible builds. You've probably heard about that effort that was started by Debian developers uh, mm, some six years ago, I think. It's a very important effort because the idea here is to make sure that we have a verifiable path from source code to binaries. And if we don't have that verifiable path, we're in troubles because how can I make sure that the software I'm running on my laptop 
really corresponds to what it's supposed to correspond to, right? How can I make sure that my Emacs executable really comes from that Emacs tarball? And that's where reproducible builds come in. So this is crucial from a user freedom perspective, but also from a security perspective, obviously. So how do we do that in Geeks? Well, here we're standing on the shoulders of Nix because we're using a functional approach, meaning that we consider each build process of, of, of a package as a pure function in the mathematical sense. So for example, if I take Emacs, we consider that the Emacs binary is the result of applying the function f to GTK, GCC, and all the, the e dependencies of Emacs, right? Where f is roughly the function that runs configure make make install at the high level view. And then, of course, it's recursive, like GTK itself is the result of applying a function to a bunch of inputs, and so on and so forth. And so that's a great way to uh, reason about reproducible builds, because in practice, when we build a package, like if I run gigs build hello, well, either I'm going to download a pre-built binary, or I'm going to build it locally in an isolated environment, chroot separate namespaces, and so on and so forth. And because it's an isolated environment, it's a very good context to, you know, to maximize the chances of having a reproducible build. It does not guarantee that the build is going to be reproducible, because for instance, if that hello package is going to store a timestamp in, in the binary, then obviously it's not reproducible bit by bit, right? but it creates the condition that make it more likely that builds are reproducible. And so if we look at the result, well, the result of a build is stored in that directory GNU store, and it has the big hash that is the hash of all the dependencies, so it uniquely identifies this particular build. And if the build is already available in store, we're not going to build it again. And all this is nearly bit identical for everyone nearly because when it's not bit identical, it means we have a bug like maybe timestamps are being stored somewhere. And so we want users to be able to take advantage of that property and for that we have a Geeks challenge command that allows users to say, well, you know, I know of two different servers that provide pre-built binaries for Geeks. I have ci.geeks.gnu.org, which is the official build farm, and I have something.example.org can I really trust these two guys, right? Like, do they get the same build results as I do? I want to know. So if I run that command, I give the URLs of those servers, then it's going to report about discrepancies. So for example, here it's telling me that OpenSSL differs, like I have a local build that has a certain hash, but the build provided by ci.geeks has a different hash, and the one by example.org has yet another hash, so there must be something wrong, right? Perhaps it's just a timestamp issue, but perhaps it's a Trojan horse. Right, so that needs investigation, and at this point you would run default scope or some kind of tool to see what the differences are. So far for reproducible builds, this is great, but then perhaps you've heard about that reflections on trusting trust paper from 1983, I think. Well, in that paper, Ken Thompson shows that, in fact, it's possible to modify a compiler, like a C compiler, in a way that will allow it to insert backdoors in the programs it compiles. And in addition to that, it will allow it to insert, a, to reproduce itself in a way that is basically impossible to diagnose, right? It makes it impossible to see that the compiler itself is backdoor. That's a problem also. And <clears throat> In general, in gigs, we want to build everything from source, right? So we have that situation where every time we have just a binary and no source, that's a problem. And that's where bootstrappable builds come in. So it's sort of, you could see it as a continuation to reproducible builds in a way. But it's all about making sure we build everything from source. And if we go to the bottom of the dependency graph of packages in gigs, well, you'll find out that not long ago, at the bottom of the dependency graph, we had these five things. And these five things are just pre-built binaries that 
we built someday, some years ago, that contains GCC, glibc, lots of software. So it's like 250 megabytes of binary blobs that are uneditable, and it doesn't feel right, right? There could be a Trojan horse in there that replicates itself and we just don't see it. That's kind of a problem. So a bunch of uh, crazy people, some of which standing in this room, uh, decided to fix it. And what's the way to fix it? Well, you need to build everything from source, right? So you need to take this guy here, this GCC, and somehow find a way to get to build GCC from source. How do you do that? Well, <laughs> it becomes a bit more complex, right? So we still have this GNU make build up there, but before we get to build GNU make, and before we, build to, we get to build GCC itself, well, we first build a very simple C compiler that in turn can build a more complex C compiler, TinyCC, which in turn can build the first GCC and then a more complex GCC. That's roughly the story. Uh, but it means that we have uh, smaller bootstrap blobs, binary blobs at, at the bottom of the graph. And so we went from 250 megabytes to 130 or 140 megabytes of binary blobs, which is already a great improvement, I think. It's not black and white, you know, it's not zero byte. That's not possible, but we're making progress. And I really invite you to go uh, tomorrow at 11.50 a.m. to the minimalist language dev, um, dev room if you want to learn more about this and what's coming next because we are going beyond, well, below 130 megabytes. This is great. I think it's crucial for free software in general and for security too. Uh, we have the same bootstrapping problem at the level of every language roughly. Every time you have a programming language compiler, you have that sort of problem. And for example, Rust is one of them. You know, the instructions to build Rust normally is just to grab a pre-built binary of the latest Rust and then you build the next version from that. That's not great. But again, we had someone also sitting in this room somewhere here who worked on this and now in Geeks we're able to build everything from source. So we have, we're using a C++ implementation of the Rust compiler to build well, the actual Rust compiler and then a series of versions of Rust. This is great. And yeah, there's a talk tomorrow about Rust packaging gigs if you are into that. All right, one last thing about source code and provenance tracking. So like I said, we have a functional model where in effect when we deploy an operating system, we apply a function, gig system build to a configuration file and the result of that is a working system. This is great. But there are cases where you would like to go the other way around, right? You would like to have the inverse function, like you have an already deployed system and you would like to see how it was deployed, how you got to that binary artifact. How do you do that? Well, again, another new feature that was recently added. There's this gig system describe command and basically, every time you instantiate your configuration with gig system reconfigure, it would also store provenance information along with your system. And in particular, it would store the configuration file itself, as well as the commit that you use to, you know, to reconfigure your system. And so from there, you can actually map your system, your binary artifact, back to source code. And this is, again, pretty cool because then you can like you can do things like bisecting your system. If, for example, a problem was introduced, you can say, all right, this was using that commit, whereas the previous generation, the one that worked was using this commit, so I can, yeah, bisect the, the problem. Um, I think that's really nice. I like that feature. <laughs> all right, I think it's about time to wrap up. So, yeah, there are actually many topics I did not include in this talk. I'm already almost out of time. Uh, there are many things going on in Geek's land, like there are many people doing crazy things. So for example, if you're into embedded systems, you may be interested in going to the uh, distribution dev room tomorrow at 11 a.m., right? So I'm just you know, giving you a great program in case you don't already have one. <laughs> so yeah, distribution dev room is going to talk about cross-compiling a complete operating system with Geek's so that you can build an image 
on a device for a specific embedded device. I didn't really mention it much, but you've probably seen all these parentheses. And in fact, Geeks relies heavily on embedded domain-specific languages in Guile scheme. And there's a lot to talk about that. And if you're into, you know, if you want to learn about the programming language technology that's used behind that and about Guile, there was a Guile 3 release just a couple of weeks ago, and it's great. You need to learn about it. You should go to the, the minimalist language dev room tomorrow at 11.30. And last, there's also ongoing work in HPC and reproducible science. Uh, I'm going to give a lightning talk about Geek's Jupyter notebook integration tomorrow, and Ephraim Flashner is also going to give a talk about the use of containers in scientific workflows. All right, so join us now, share the parents. I invite you to install the thing. You can actually install Geeks on top of your distribution, or you can choose to go for the, the one through way of installing Geek system, the standalone distribution, but you really have the choice of using Geeks on your own distribution and it's just an additional package manager, or going all the way to Geek system. And you can hack it, and you can also join us. We are offering uh, now Twitch into Chimp, so if you want to join us, maybe now is a good time to get into free software to hack on, on really nice things, All right? So just to sum up, we have Geeks. It allows you to do package management, environment management, and have virtual env, container provisioning with Geeks Pack, and operating system provisioning with Geeks System and Geeks Deploy. The takeaway message here is that we've all migrated over the last decade, maybe, to distributed version control systems, and we've learned to value you know, what it brings us in terms of being able to have a, a, a track record of how we change our source code and being able to, you know, to reference a specific point of time of our source code, right? We have commit IDs, we can, we can be very precise about source code. I think reproducible deployment is a logical next step, and that's why I would encourage you to look into that technology. This is it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ludovic, for a great talk. Now it's time for QA. Uh, please stay silent and uh, give uh, the possibility only to ones who are uh, asking questions and answering uh, yeah, to talk. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, first hand. Um, I uh, you, you were mentioning reproducible builds and uh, were mentioning the reproducible builds in context of the uh, of the system of the whole uh, of the whole environment. Um, I do have to admit that I don't really care about that part because when I care about reproducibility, I care about some specific aspects of it where I have a, a specific version that I need of that, What's but there. There are other, how would you, uh, how would you handle uh, things like libraries that I want to have updated and have, like, I don't know, OpenSSL, where I don't care what version it is, I want the latest one. Well, so by default, Geeks would give you the latest version of the package you asked for. That's the story. So it's like pretty much any package manager in that respect, you just... Like with apt, for example, you would run apt get update and then apt get install open SSL and presumably you get the latest version. And with Geeks, you would just run Geeks pool and then Geeks install open SSL and you get the latest version. That, that's the story. Does that answer your question? Uh, but then the reproducibility uh, the gets lost. No, it, it doesn't because every time you, you deploy software with Geeks, you deploy it from a specific Geeks revision. And so you can link that revision to a specific version of OpenSSL, for example. Yeah. Um, the question kind of relates to Docker file, which you bashed for being non-descriptive, right? Yeah. And the answer, I guess, was the last command you presented, describe, right? Yes. Or what it was. Geeks right. described this scenario. What is cool about Docker file is that you announce your intention. I want to install package blah. 
and you don't care about what is the hundred dependencies, right? When you call to describe, most likely you are describing the whole environment, which will lose this kind of intentional, you know, description. What did they want to achieve for right. this environment? Is there any work to kind of embed that semantic, which is somewhat inherited in the stages or what you call history of the environment, which somewhat describes what yeah. it was made for? Right, so how do you record what it is that you actually wanted to deploy, right? That's, yeah. So, yeah, there are really two pieces of information here. So one is what you get with Gigs Describe, which tells you which Gigs revision you're using. And then there is this manifest file where you specify that you want, I don't know, this package, that package available for you. And so I think... The, this manifest file that describes the packages that you want to have installed is kind of similar to what you would do in a Docker file when you say app get install foo, app get install bar. This is where you say what you want to have deployed, right? Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Um, there is no more questions. <laughs> yes and no. Uh, Docker file forces Docker users to describe it. With gigs, I could describe just by running the commands and kind of losing this forceful description, right? Oh, by, by running gigs install, you mean, for example. Right, so, yeah, so gigs supports really two modes of operation. So one of them is to use the, the manifest where you have to describe everything, right? You have to describe every package you want to deploy, but it also supports the interactive gigs install thing, which is more freestyle. I personally like it, actually. I think it's good to have something that resembles app get install, for example. But, yeah, I agree with you. When you start using it, then you kind of lose the, the declarative way. And so people have been complaining about it, actually. And there, is, there are ongoing discussions that would allow us about tools that would allow us to export an existing profile with a set of install packages to a manifest that would be like the declarative thing that I showed. So that you would have a bridge from the, you know, the imperative approach where you just type gigs install full bar to the declarative thing, that file that says everything you want to have installed. Okay. <laughs> I hope that you can move also discussion somewhere online because time is over. Uh, thank you, Ludovic, again for this great presentation. Thank you. <laughs>